welcome to XM All Access. I'm Tamara Robertson, and I'm excited to be a part of this virtual XM series showcasing some of the coolest minds in STEM. Are you curious about careers in science, technology, engineering, or math? Have you wondered if a job in a STEM field is for you? Or maybe you have no idea what type of career to pursue and you're searching for a little inspiration. If you fall into any of these categories, or even if you're just here for fun, you've come to the right place. As your guest host for this episode, I am so excited to chat with Joan Melenez Meisner. She's an engineer at NASA, and I'm going to be asking Joan all the questions you'd like to know about her job, like what inspires her, and what it's like to be an engineer in the space industry. Make sure you subscribe in the YouTube description below and follow us on social media to get updates on new XM episodes. Scan this code to access resources from today's programming, including NGSS and Castle Aligned lesson plans and worksheets, along with other STEM resources from today's speakers, our partners, and more. With your parents' permission, tell us how you were inspired today by tagging us at USA Science Fest hashtag XSTEM, and at the real Tamara Robertson. This free STEM program is brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. The mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation about careers in STEM. You can check out their other free programs and events for teachers and students at usasciencefestival.org. Before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Space Force, and the Discovery Channel for making this XM series possible. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Many of you probably already know me as a TV host for shows like Mythbusters, Mythbusters Jr., and Sidejinks. But long before that, I became a chemical and biomolecular engineer, which has given me the opportunity to travel the world doing relief work in disaster situations, designing and building technologies like eco-friendly plastics and packaging process to extend shelf life and remove waste from landfills, and even make pandemic vaccines. There really is no limit to what you can do when you pursue a career in STEM. I hope you're as excited as I am to meet today's speaker and fellow engineer, Joan Melenez Meisner. Joan is an engineer at NASA, and today she's going to share all about her role at our nation's space agency. Joan is also a part-time science communicator who uses her platform to encourage women to pursue careers in STEM. Recently, she was selected as one of five people to train for an upcoming commercial astronaut program. Stay tuned because we'll hear way more about that later. I can't wait to learn more now though, so please join me in welcoming Joan Melenez Meisner. Hi Tamara, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Joan Melendez Meisner and I'm an integration engineer for the space industry, specifically at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. I work on uncrewed and scientific missions that go to space. Joan, it's so great to meet you. Let's jump into our questions because I know the audience is excited to hear from you. What inspired you to study engineering and eventually embark on a career in space? What inspired me to get into engineering is kind of an odd story. Um, so I started off really young looking at the stars in Barranquitas, Puerto Rico, which is up in the mountains. So it's a really nice area where there's not a lot of light, not a lot of buildings, so you can see the stars very clearly. Um, so I was asking a lot of questions as a young kid, um, asking to wear teles or to buy telescopes, to wear lab coats. Like I wanted to be a scientist when I was growing up. Um, and then it wasn't until when I got older that I decided that I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to help people and I love helping people um, and maybe even be a doctor for um, NASA astronauts. And it wasn't until my first year in college where I volunteered at a Florida hospital. Um, specifically, I volunteered in the emergency room and that was the best and worst experience of my life because not only did I see a whole bunch of blood and needles in the emergency room um, and I flat out passed out on the floor, like I hit my head and passed out. So, you know, I had to course correct. And um, so it wasn't until I started talking to my guidance counselor in college and um, she was like, hey, you know, you have a curiosity for how things work. You like science, you like math, you know, have you ever thought about engineering? And, um, you know, I never really thought about that because I never really saw myself in that field because it was very male dominated. So um, 
you know, I was able to uh, take some classes and I fell in love with the, the engineering world and I finally got an internship working on Navy jets. And from there on out, I just fell in love with the, with the whole concept of, you know, working with your hands, being able to solve complex issues. And that's why I love engineering. Joan, you and I already have something in common. My journey to becoming an engineer was also not a direct path. I actually started out a history major with the intention of going into the military as an officer. And it was my sophomore year when a math teacher took me aside and introduced me to the idea of engineering. I didn't even know it was an option for women at the time. So like you, I went in, I tried it, and during my first internship, I fell absolutely in love with the engineering process. So speaking of that process, I'm curious about your role at NASA. Tell us about your job as a mission integration systems engineer. What programs are you involved in and how does your work at NASA impact the general public? Yeah, as a mission integration engineer at NASA, my role is to make sure that the payload, whether it be a spacecraft or a satellite, survives the launch. Because, you know, when you're launching a rocket, there's so many different environments that are going against the rocket, not just gravity. And so your role is to make sure that you calculate any trajectories that you would need to where it's supposed to go, whether it's supposed to just orbit our planet or head to Mars or any other place in our solar system. Um, you need to make sure that you that it survives. So a really good example is I'm a huge roller coaster nerd. I live in Orlando, Florida, so I love roller coasters. So imagine me being on a roller coaster. You want to make sure that once you are in your seat, you have your seatbelt on, that you make it all the way to the end of the ride. There's going to be a lot of ups and downs. There's going to be a lot of uh, tight turns. There's going to be a lot of fast going moving forward. Um, but you want to make sure that you stay inside of the vehicle. And that is what our role is as an integration engineer, is you have to help and make sure that that spacecraft survives the launch and it stays intact inside of the fairing which is the very top portion of the rocket and so it's going to be again going against so many different elements once it goes uh, once it launches so you want to make sure that that is tested there is vibrations there's loads there's environments that are going against that rocket so you want to make sure that you or the payload stays intact and so you know we do a lot of testing we want to make sure that we write a lot of requirements that shows that we're going to make it to where it's supposed to go that it survives the launch um, and so as part of the uncrewed and scientific mission for the launch services program, I specifically work on missions that do not have astronauts, that do, do not have any human beings on board. So we work with satellites, we work with uh, probes, we work with rovers, uh, we work with uh, things that explore our planet and beyond. And it's really exciting to be able to uh, work on these missions and really explore what's out there. We all get excited watching astronauts journey into space, but you're right. Unmanned space exploration is so important too. Plus it allows us to study environments that humans can't get to. Speaking of exploring our planet and beyond, you're part of NASA's DART mission to protect our planet from asteroids. Literally crashing spacecraft into asteroids to deflect them from hitting our planet? This sounds like a plot straight out of a sci-fi movie. Tell us more about DART and how it felt to be a part of the recent successful attempt to move an asteroid in space. I um, do talks to middle school, high school students like yourselves. Um, I talk about the movie Armageddon. So it was an early 2000s movie and there's an asteroid that was headed towards Earth. And so in order for us to survive, we had to send a crew of um, mechanics to drill a hole and then put a nuclear bomb in it to explode it, um, to for it to go into millions of little pieces and then the atmosphere could uh, disintegrate the little small rocks. Um, but, and then the movie was Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck, but um, I have to remember that now that was close to 20 years ago, so I had to update my reference, and now I talk about Don't Look Up, which just came out last year um, on Netflix, and that's talking about an asteroid that's headed our way as well. Um, but yeah, it was it felt like very science fiction when I was in, on this mission, um, because there's so many really di cool different elements. Not only did we send a spacecraft to an asteroid, we launched it in November of last year, and it just uh, slammed into the asteroid September 26th of this year, so it took about 10 months to um, for that uh, spacecraft to make it to the Didymo system. Um, but we're also testing a lot of different technology as well. So if any of you guys uh, watch Star Wars, 
um, whenever you're looking at the the, sp uh, the ships that are going flying around space uh, you see that like engine it has like a blue flare to it um, that's a an ion propulsion engine and so that's supposed to help us get to places a lot faster that was on dart we tested that system while we were launching to collide with an asteroid so it's a really really neat project that I was really proud to be a part of. Uh, we call ourselves the Planetary Defenders because it was the first time that we have ever uh, tried to test our planetary defense. So if there's ever an asteroid that's headed our way, uh, this is a good opportunity or good possibility for us to send something to deflect it. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's a lot of a lot of work to do because, you know, it took about um, close to 10 years for this mission to launch. You know, there's a lot of, you know, the, the components that we had to test. There's a lot of calculation because um, if you think about it, you're essentially throwing a uh, baseball and you're throwing it extremely far, about 13, 14 million miles away. Um, and you're launching it towards a moving object so that the the asteroid is not standing still the asteroid is moving so not only do you have to calculate where exactly that asteroid is going to be in order for it to crash into it um so i mean a wrong calculation we could have missed it we could have not crashed into it so there's a lot of math a lot of flight trajectory that goes along behind the scenes that we have to do but um september 26th of this year we collided with it head on exactly where we wanted to hit it um and we were able to deflect it or, or slightly nudge it by a few minutes and so um, we were expecting about 20-ish minutes for it to be moved um, but it ended up being closer to like 32 so it ex exceeded our expectations of the mission and so um, yeah I was super happy to be a part of it and I was so happy that um, it worked and that um, you know, a lot of people knew about it because it's, uh, like you mentioned, it's a very sci-fi kind of um, project and I was so honored to be on it. I love your analogy to throwing a baseball toward a moving target 14 million miles away. What an exciting accomplishment for you and the rest of the DART team. And having Planetary Defender on your resume must be a pretty cool thing. But as if that wasn't exciting enough, you're also one of five people who have been selected to train as a commercial astronaut for a future space flight. Can you tell us about this commercial astronaut program and how it feels to potentially travel to space someday in the near future? I, um, I was selected as one of five uh, commercial astronauts for the Space Plus program and I am so honored and I can still can't believe that I'm training to become a commercial astronaut for a future space flight mission. Um, so, you know, I, I've been applying to, I, I want to go to space, I want to be an astronaut, but the really cool thing about what's happening nowadays is you have these companies, you have these private companies being able to offer space flight to people who are not NASA astronauts, who are not uh, selected to be part of the astronaut corps. So, you know, they're opening up access more to people who may not have those opportunities. So um, to become a NASA astronaut, you have to have a master's degree in science, technology, engineering, or math, um, or you have to have uh, several hundreds of hours of flight time, so like a pilot. Um, and so they, I think the last application process was, was like 2019, 2020, about 12,000 people applied and then they only choose about 12 people. So that's a very low probability of you becoming a NASA astronaut. So, um, you know, having these private companies opening it up a little bit more to people who may not have a STEM degree. So one of my crewmates, um, he is an artist. He does not have a degree in STEM, but he is a, a really good artist and he, um, I think he's like 57, so he's he's um, above the range that you would normally see people going to space. So again, this is opening up so much access to so many different people. So I'm honored to be a part of this program. Um, you know, our training started back in October, so we started with our zero G flight. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, a zero G flight is just a Boeing 727 plane, so a plane that you would take to visit your grandma for Christmas in another state. Um, and so what it does that it flies in parabolas and so what it is is it's uh, in the air um about 20 22,000 feet i don't remember um 22,000 feet and so what it is is it goes in parabolas so it angles and it goes up and then once you're going up you're laying down on the ground and you're experiencing uh, about two to three g's and what that is is about two to three times your body weight so imagine yourself and there's like two people uh identical twins of you on top of you so you're uh, feeling that pressure and then once it goes down it angles down at such a point that you start floating as if there's no gravity and all of this is done here on earth in um, a specific air 
space. Um, but it's really cool because it goes up and down, up and down. And so when you go down and that's when you uh, get to float in the plane. And I, I remember when I first um, started floating, I did not know, how, like it was like such a really cool experience. Again, I'm gonna go back to roller coasters. So like when you go down on a roller coaster, uh, you have that like pit in your stomach where you're like kind of free. Imagine that, but you're not strapped. You're just like floating. So I remember there's one picture of me like on the top of the ceiling of the plane and that's like never happened before. So it was a really cool experience, um, but that's a way for you to train sort of your body. So once you get into, um, into space, that's you have no gravity. So you will ha be experiencing that and I remember on the zero G flight, um, I put my feet on the foot of the, uh, sorry, I put my feet on the um, ceiling of the plane. So I was kind of like this, I was upside down, my head down here, my feet up there. Um, my brain immediately thought that that was the ground. And so it's kind of an interesting to see like how your, your mind plays tricks on you. Like you knew that that's not the ground, but your mind was like, yes, it actually is the ground. So um, yeah, we started training in October. We just did some egress space suit training this past weekend. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to be able to be part of this program and I'm excited to one day uh, be able to see our beautiful blue planet from above in the in the skies. It is really exciting that space travel is becoming accessible to everyone. I remember being a little girl looking up into space and wanting to be among the stars, but I had Coke bottle glasses and was rocking an inhaler, so I wasn't going to be a pilot, let alone an astronaut. So I'm so thankful to see people of all types finally getting to go to space. I think that not only is it going to inspire future STEM leaders, but we're going to get so much scientific perspective on how prolonged space exposure affects different bodies of people that we haven't seen in space before, like your teammate who's from a different age group. Now we all encounter roadblocks or obstacles in our career paths. What's an obstacle you faced and how did you overcome it? And how did that experience ultimately influence you? When I started my social media, I started posting pictures of just me working, uh, you know, on planes. And then now I work on rockets and uh, spacecraft and payloads. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were interested. They're, they love to see, you know, more women in these fields. They love to see more representation in the media. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to do on my social media is talk about um, not only my successes, but also how I got there, um, you know, any obstacles, any roadblocks, any failures that I had, because I know when I was growing up and I saw people on Instagram, first of all, there weren't a lot of um, women in STEM uh, back then, but, um, you know, you'd see a lot of like beauty influencers, travel influencers, um, you know, stuff like that. And so, um, you know, there was that void. So I definitely wanted to post about that. But I always, um, I don't know if anybody, if you feel this way, but you always feel that their life is so much better because they're, you know, they're, they're so happy in all their pictures or traveling all over the place. And so um, you never see how hard it was to get to where they are. And so one of the things that I really wanted to focus on on my social media is to show the process, to show um, that even though I became a NASA engineer, um, there's so many things that happen along the way. Um, you know, a, one good example is that I applied to be a NASA engineer 13 times and I never got an interview. Um, and at any point I could have just said, nope, uh, they don't want me. And I remember, I think I remember talking to my husband and I was like, yeah, they, it's never gonna happen. They don't want me. I just not, never gonna be an engineer at NASA. Um, but you know, if I stopped at seven, three, 11, 13, um, I would have never been where I am now. Um, so I think it's really important to talk about, you know, obviously talk about what you do now, but you also wanna talk about um, what's below that iceberg. So um, that iceberg theory where you only see the tip of the iceberg uh, above the water, um, but you don't see any the iceberg underneath the water. And so at the top of that iceberg is my successes. I'm an ass engineer, um, you know, I'm a planetary defender, but underneath it, you don't talk about the failure. You don't talk about, um, I failed organic chemistry when I was in college um, as a chemistry major. So, you know, there's so many different things that go along the way, imposter syndrome. And so you wanna make sure that you talk about the humanness of being a woman in STEM or being an engineer in the space industry because it gets people more motivated because if they look at you and they say, wow, she um, failed organic chemistry, I failed organic chemistry, I can still become a NASA engineer. It's super important to me um, to talk about more about the realness of how you got to where you are versus just the, the perfect life of what, you know, what you normally see on social media. So I think it's extremely important to talk about those obstacles and roadblocks um, because to me, 
Um, you inspire more people when you're more human, when you're more realistic, because then when they feel that they've hit a roadblock or they have had a hurdle in their life, um, you know, by showing that you have been there too, but just to keep going, if you have that perseverance and you just got to keep going, that you'll end up where you want to be. So I think it's more powerful to talk about um, your journey versus just the, the, the happiness of where you are right now. Joan, I love that you celebrate and share the obstacles you face along with the successes. Thank you for keeping it real. It's no secret that you're passionate about your job and that you use that passion to inspire others, specifically women and minorities, about opportunities in STEM. What advice do you have for individuals with an interest in engineering or any STEM field, but are worried they don't fit a certain criteria? I think that, um... It's really important to understand that everybody learns differently. So for me, um, it took me a very long time, like especially when I, I mentioned I failed organic chemistry, I thought that I wasn't smart enough to finish that class, that I was just not getting it, that I just, my brain is not made for STEM. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, after college and everything that I realized that there was a lot of people co-workers and peers that failed classes throughout their college career, high school. Um, so it's it's really important to know that you're not born with a, a STEM gene or a science or math gene. Um, you just have to work at it. And so some people may grasp the material a lot faster. It doesn't mean that they're smarter than you. It just means that um, their brain works a little bit different. So for me, I'm very open. I have uh, ADHD. So when I was in college, it was very difficult for me to stay focused, um, especially in class. And so when I was taking tests, I would have test anxiety and it's not necessarily that I didn't grasp the material. It's just, I just having anxiety and it's okay. Um, but you know, in classes where I was in a lab, I would excel in it because I was physically doing something with my hands. So for me, I learned that in order for me to learn and grasp the material, I have to physically, um, be doing it. I think it's, I forgot, I think it's like kinesthetic learner or something like that. But you know, some people are auditory learners, some, some people are visual, visual, and then some people you have to physically do it, um, <clears throat> in order for you to grasp that material. And so that's why I excelled in labs because I was learning the material and then going into the lab and physically doing that reaction or doing something like that. So, you know, my advice is don't give up and don't um, be easily swayed because you think that you don't have that gene or that you're not smart enough because you are. You just have to figure out how you physically learn and how you are able to grasp that material. And you know, it took me all of college to really figure that out for me. So, you know, it's never too late to really, um, you know, sit down and figure out if it's something that you really want to do, just keep going for it. Just, you know, put your all into it and really figure out how you learn. It's so true that we all learn in our own unique way. As a chemical and biomolecular engineer, I can tell you that organic chemistry was no walk in the park, even for us. I actually remember our instructor was really tough and she prided herself on building tests that everyone failed. She used to say that we were all either going to be doctors or vets and her job was to weed out anyone that wouldn't help her or her pet in an operating room. Of course, all of us engineers were always like, wait a minute, we're never going to be in an OR, but course requirements are what they are. So to all of the students out there, if you're struggling in one of your math or science courses, don't jump to the conclusion that a STEM field isn't for you. There's so many variables that go into what makes someone successful in these fields and grades are only a small part of it. Persistence, curiosity, and a willingness to learn and getting hands on is a much bigger part of being in STEM. With technology constantly evolving and improving at a rapid pace, it's hard to imagine where the future of space exploration will take us. Joan, what do you think will be the next big endeavor in the space industry. Are there any unknowns about our planet or the universe that you're hoping we'll find answers to through your work at NASA? Technology is forever evolving and the space industry is no different. Um, you know, a really good example is Perseverance that we launched back in uh, 2020. 
um, and it's currently on Mars. What it's doing, it's collecting few, uh, collecting samples of the soil and then putting them into these test tubes and then just dropping them. And so right now, one of our missions called the Mars Sample Return Team is we're working to build a rover slash spacecraft that's gonna go to Mars, identify where these vials are, pick them up, bring them back here to our planet so we can analyze these samples. Um, it's gonna be the first time that we're gonna be able to analyze soil uh, from Mars on another planet uh, here with our you know uh, advanced technology machines that are huge. Normally we can't build that onto the rover because of weight limitations um, but it's going to be really neat and so that's going to help us uh, understand what we can do when we eventually go to Mars like what we can grow what can how can we survive with the soil that's out there um, so for me the future of space exploration is um, you know not only uh, eventually sending uh, the first astronauts to Mars, but also uh, a little bit closer to home, we have, um, you know, hopefully we'll be building a moon colony. So, you know, we recently launched the Artemis mission, which kicked off us returning back to the moon. And so, you know, I think that <clears throat> not only are we going to see ourselves back on the moon, but I feel like we're going to be having a more permanent presence on the moon. Um, and especially with Gateway, which is going to be orbiting uh, the moon, it's gonna be sort of like a gas station to eventually go to Mars. So, um, you know, the next couple decades are gonna be so so exciting for the space industry for at least uh, humankind being able to, you know, have not only have a permanent presence on the moon, but eventually getting to Mars. Um, and then, you know, we're constantly uh, figuring stuff out on our own planet. So, um, you know, I remember back in 2020, uh, we launched the Sentinel-6 pro uh, program, which is a satellite right now collecting data on the height of our oceans um, to help us battle climate change. Uh, so there's still a lot of stuff that we can learn here um, in our home planet. Um, but I feel that we're gonna be uh, kind of expanding a little bit more, you know, first the moon and then eventually Mars. Wow, sending the first astronauts to Mars and creating colonies on the moon? It's crazy to think these achievements could take place in our lifetime. Joan, tell us something about you that might surprise people just as much as this. So, you know, a lot of people know me as as huge in STEM, um, but before, you know, obviously I told you that I wanted to be a doctor, but um, I'm actually a huge uh, music nerd. Behind me, I have my clarinet. So I play the clarinet, I play the saxophone, and then I also play the piano. Um, I got a scholarship to play the clarinet uh, when I went to college. So the first two years, um, I had my classes paid for because I was uh, in band. Um, so, you know, there, there are so many different avenues you can have. Like, you don't have to only have to uh, be interested in engineering or, or STEM, but, um, you know, I'm a huge music nerd, uh, classical music since I was, um, I don't know, elementary school is when I first picked up the, the clarinet, fifth grade. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a classically trained clarinetist and um, I've been to several competitions. I've been um, part of the all state band for Florida, all county when I was here in Florida as well. So, you know, um, not a lot of people know that I'm also a huge music nerd on top of being um, a STEM major. <laughs> Being an engineer doesn't mean you can't have a creative side. So for our last question, Joan, can you give the students one takeaway thought to leave with? The one quote that I want to leave you with that is a quote that I use every single time that I talk, and I know I've talked about this before with the obstacles, but um, failure is not the opposite of success. It is part of every success story. So embrace your obstacles, embrace your stumbles, embrace your failures. As long as you pick yourself back up and you have the perseverance and will to keep on going, you'll get to where you wanna be. I couldn't agree more. Failures are as instrumental to our path as our successes. What a great note to end our conversation on. Thank you, Joan. I enjoyed chatting with you and hearing about your work at NASA and your perseverance to achieve your goals so much. Thank you for sharing your never give up attitude. It's truly an inspiration. Everyone, please check out Joan and keep up with her adventures in space engineering. But don't go anywhere yet. Let's take a moment to hear more from our partners at the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force.
Make sure you check out the Air Force and Space Force online and follow them on social media to keep up with all the amazing things they're doing. Thank you again to the United States Air Force, the United States Space Force, and the Discovery Channel for making this XM All Access series possible. And thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe in the YouTube description below and follow us on social media to get XM updates about new episodes. You'll want to miss any of them. Plus, you'll get access to fun weekly content for students and teachers, such as STEM trivia for students, classroom tips for teachers, and so much more. Use the code to access resources from today's program, including NGSS and Castle Aligned lesson plans and worksheets, along with other free STEM resources from today's speakers, our partners, and more. With your parents' permission, tell us how you were inspired today by tagging us at USA Science Fest, hashtag XM, and me at The Real Tamara Robertson. And keep up with me through my website and social media to see Seekers of Science and Tinkering Bells and hear from real living scientists and makers all around the globe. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. This episode, along with the entire series, is available on demand at no cost. Check them out at usasciencefestival.org. I had a blast being your host today, but don't sign off just yet. You'll want to stick around through the end of this video for a fun trivia game that you can do in the classroom or at home. Have fun!